Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast. Now, I am going to be talking to Richard Flohill in just a little bit. He's about to turn 85 later this month, and he has done it all in the music business. Can't think of a job he hasn't done, but he's most known as a publicist and a promoter, and musicians just love him. And music is in his bones, even though he doesn't sing, he doesn't play anything. He is a music hero in Toronto and across Canada. So we're going to hear about him in just a little bit. And in the meantime, I do want to thank some sponsors. I want to thank Barbarian Steakhouse. Uh, they've been with me from the beginning, and they are a fantastic restaurant. If you're looking for a special occasion, you want to close a business deal, or you just want a great meal, check it out, 7 Elm Street here in Toronto. And also, barberfinancial.com or .ca. Uh, Paul, Captain Paul, another guy who's been here from the very beginning. If you need help with your finances, he's been doing this for decades, and he's a good friend of mine. Be sure to drop my name when you go to barberfinancial.com. Just check out his site, and you'll see if there's something he can do for you. Uh, what else? Patreon. Thank you to everyone who's sponsoring me on Patreon. Uh, it's an interesting idea, and I love it. Basically, you throw me five or ten bucks a month, and uh, it helps me out a lot. Uh, freelance artist, trying to do my best. If it means something to you, why not help out? Five bucks a month? Can't hurt that much, can it? I don't know. Maybe it could. Well, so if it hurts, don't do it. Here we go. Friday, June 7th. All right. We're going to start with Lula Lounge. Uh, music from Venezuela, Brazil, Cuba. Uh, friendly, rich uh, book signing. Uh, it's a launch and a concert with uh, Dominic Mancuso. Also, Bianca Gismonti is here, is coming to town, and there's so much going on because it's Lula World. So don't just listen to me. Go right now to lula.ca and see how many amazing concerts there are coming up in the next week. Uh, over at Jazz Bistro, Stephanie Trick and Paolo Alderghi. Alderigi, I can say it. Uh, they're tonight and tomorrow, and this dynamic duo, they're married, and they have four hands on one piano. It'll blow your freaking mind. You've got to go see this. If you're a fan of the piano, uh, they're really going to blow you away. It's highly entertaining, highly musical. Um, what else is there? On the 11th of June, Tuesday, Jessica Lalonde, a singer I just love. If you don't know her, uh, think a jazz version of Julie Andrews or something like that. She's classy, and she spells classy with a C, not a K. Um, Danielle Bassels is there on Wednesday. That's always amazing. And Thursday to Saturday, Colin Hunter is back crooning. Jazzbistro.ca for all the listings, and I'll get to some more Colin Hunter news in a minute. Uh, tonight, Hughes Room Live, Las Variants. This is jazz, Afro-funk, Cuban, Middle Eastern music, all blended together, a bunch of award-winning musicians, including Michael Acapinti. Uh, so that's going to be amazing. Also, there's something happening every single night for the next week. I'll give you a couple of highlights. Steve Hill is a one-man blues band. He plays uh, drums and cymbals and things with his feet while he plays guitar and sings, and it's really entertaining. Um, uh, the Thursday the 13th, it's the Cabana Room Acoustic Reunion. So tons of artists that used to play the old Cabana Room down at... Uh, King and Spadina. It's been a long time since that room's been gone. So it's kind of an interesting thing to do a celebration. I mean, look at who's there. Catherine Rose, Arlene Bishop, Andrew Cash. Heck, I'll be there too. It's going to be a ton of uh, famous folk singers, pop singers. They're all going to be at HughesRoomLive.com in the next week. So check it out, HughesRoomLive.com. Then over to... Uh, OldMillToronto.com. You can go to the Homesmith Bar tonight and enjoy the Canadian Jazz Quartet. Although, if you want to go there, you better get there early. They always jam the place uh, when they play there on a Friday night. Show 7.30 to 10.30. No cover, $20 minimum. Uh, parking directly across the street. And uh, next week, John McLeod will be there on the 12th. Adrian Ferrugia and Sophia Perlman on the 13th. All the listings, OldMillToronto.com. And now a few special things here. Cahill El Zabar and David Murray are coming to town. Every time Cahill El Zabar comes to town, I go. Unless I'm out of town, you know I'm going to be there. He's one of the most interesting percussionists I've ever seen. And a groovy, groovy dude. Uh, played with the Cats from uh, Sun Ra Orchestra. He's from Chicago. Uh, musicologist. He's got degrees in everything. He's done soundtracks. He's an amazing guy. He's at Remix 1305 Dundas Street West. 7 p.m. on Friday, June 21st. 
They say 7 p.m. I've never seen a show uh, start on time at Remix because it's kind of laid back there. So get there for 7. So you got a seat. Uh, I'm assuming the show will be on about 8. Uh, CalibanArtsTheater.com is where you'll get information. And uh, there it is. So click on there and get yourself some advanced tickets. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, oh, Colin Hunter and the Starlight Orchestra. Okay, I did this party for my birthday uh, last year. April, April 13th. They jammed the place. 350 kids were showing up. I mean, adults too, but they were throwing each other around. There's a lot of young swing dancers that really know how to do the Lindy Hop, and they love to dance all night long. Four hours of nonstop dancing. And then some of the older people get up and dance a few songs and then sit back and watch them go crazy. Uh, this is also during the summer, so there's going to be a big patio outside. Oh, I love the Palais Royale. It's the best dance floor in the city, probably the country. And uh, it's just such a magic venue. Tickets for that are $40, 20 for students with ID, and um, all the money's going to Jazz FM. It's a wonderful thing to do a benefit, and it is happening on the 22nd. It's a Saturday, June 22nd, the day after Cahill El Zabar. This is going to be a crazy time. Um, Combo Royale are opening, and Combo Royale are an amazing little group, I think seven-piece band, really hard swing, really great dance music. The whole night is about dancing. You can go to jazz.fm. You can go to palaisroyale.ca, but uh, get your tickets in advance and uh, I will we'll see you there. It's going to be amazing. And one more thing, June 28th, Richard Flohill turns 85. He's got a big concert. He's got a party at the Horseshoe. Anyone can go. The money goes to Unison Fund, Unison Benevolent Fund, and uh, you can get information at horseshoetavern.com. What a lot of stuff. And speaking of Richard Flohill, he's coming up right now. And the thing i got to tell you I love so Out much about here. Richard... Oh, Out of here. Uh, uh, My turn next. <laughs> Hello there. How are you? <laughs> Very good. You're Richard Flohill. Richard Flohill, tell me your story. When did you get to Toronto? Oh, uh, well, um, apprentice newspaper reporter age 16 comes to Canada when he's become a real newspaper reporter when I was, I don't know, 23, 24. I've been here for 61 years. I've always lived in Toronto. I love the city and people can bitch about the TTC or how many condos they're building and I don't care. I love this town, I love the energy. Uh, when I came here, the tallest building was the Bank of Commerce at 30 stories. Not only was it the tallest building in Toronto, it was the tallest building in the whole British Commonwealth. <laughs> and the second tallest building, whoa, the Royal York Hotel. I remember seeing that from the from the boat. You could see yeah. it, and now you can't you see it anywhere. No, you yeah, can't. amazing. I love this city. You've seen so many changes. What is one change uh, in in arts and culture? What's a, what's a major change for you in the in the live scene? I'm for the first time um, disappointed and somewhat depressed with the live music scene here. I think our telephones. Netflix, our computers, our social media are swamping the times when we go out to listen to live music. I'm a bit of an idiot in the sense that I'll go out four or five or six nights a week, mainly because I've seen everything I want to see on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. And I, God knows my phone, I can look out in the bus to or from the gig. But I, I for the first time see uh, a, a, a falling off of, of interest in live music and that makes me very sad because the record industry has gone to hell in a handcart and and now I always used to say well it's all right there'll always be live music my friend Corin Raymond has a song called there'll always be a small time and I don't remember the exact lyric but he says we're playing back in the parlors and the pubs like we used to do, but there will always be folk like us singing songs for folk like you. And it's true, but it is small, small time, or else it's huge, big time. I, I was in London in the fall and went to see Shania Twain. I mean, musically, not where my head's at, but was I impressed? I really was. First, for somebody whose career I was confidently told was over, she sold out a 20,000 seats arena stadium. 
the production was amazing. Uh, every costume change she did, and there were six during the show, were living proof that the woman has the best legs in the world. Secondly, the other thing that made me just raise my eyebrows in, in happiness was that instead of curtains parting, spotlights on the stage, a gilded staircase, she came on stage walking through the audience in a 20,000 seat arena and you go, what? Mind you, the bodyguards she had made the average American football player look like a dwarf. However, <laughs> <laughs> she high-fived everybody, she had a great attitude and a great... I was very impressed. Yeah. So the middle area you're talking about, you still go out to all of those clubs where there could be a hundred or three hundred. Or you still, sixty. Or sixty. <laughs> yeah. um, do you think it keeps you young? Because you were looking pretty good for eighty-five. Your energy level. Uh, do you think do you attribute any of that to to music? Oh, I I can I I I think it's everything to do with music, and it's to do with having a bucket list of things you want to do and places you want to go and and working towards them and always having something I'm hoping for example um, yet to be confirmed and whatever but I'm hoping to go to Australia with Shakura Saida in, in April next year I'm going to six music festivals in seven weeks this summer uh, I've got this stupid birthday party um, at the end of June um, after next April I don't have anything yet but hopefully touch wood I will and um, John Lee Hooker grizzled old blues singer was interviewed when he was 86 and he was finishing a gig and they said are you going to retire Mr Hooker and he said it's too late I quit now <laughs> the other quote I love was my old now gone friend Muddy Waters who said I may be old but I have young fashioned ways and it is odd that you know now as my body begins to fall apart I have a, a limp that is awkward and difficult because I have something wrong with one of my knees or legs um, and so that happens and in inevitably um, but when your body is 80, nearly 85 and your brain is somewhere 35, 40, it's, a, it's weird. There are all sorts of things you can't do as well in your 80s as you did in your 40s. Sex, obviously, mm -hmm. getting in and out of cars. There's all sorts of things you just don't do as well. I've had a few people that are, have moved a little forward in age, let's say, yeah. and they, they've all said that that lack of chasing after sex also opens up all new avenues and opportunities. Lupa Monti was saying he loves music now more than he ever did in his entire life. That's good to hear from a, from a professional musician. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I love Leonard Cohen's line, I still ache in the places where I used to play. I just <laughs> thought that was a brilliant, brilliant line and I understand where it's coming from. Now, um, most people know who you are. Right. Uh, well, apparently, I, I oh. sometimes say, because I work in roots music, blues, folk, alternative country, whatever. I sometimes say that I have become, just because of longevity, a mini, micro, tiny, quote, celebrity in a rapidly disappearing business. <laughs> uh, but it is true. People um, know me because I'm over Facebook like a blanket and I play a lot with social media um, and kind of enjoy the feeling that in some way or other I'm connecting with people because I like people and most people 99.9% .9 of them are good people and they're friendly and warm and, and, and supportive and I think the best thing about the music business for me is that everybody in it sort of supports each other. Um, if you're into blues, there's a whole network of people and places and other bands. If you're into folk, 
whatever the F word means these days, um, the same thing. Um, I think the biggest problem is for artists who get out of a niche and move into the wider pop music circles because they need an incredible amount of money or better still a record company with an amazing amount of money to to support them it's it's very hard to have a community hardcore metal freaks now there's a community if ever there was one jazz world depending on what kind of you know what right smooth definition. jazz or bebop yeah. yeah well i don't think smooth jazz exists if it's if it's smooth it isn't jazz in my view <laughs> <laughs> it's something else. I don't know. What do you tell people when they ask you what you do? I say that I do everything in the music business except sing, play an instrument, or dance. Because I dance like a pregnant elephant and it frightens children and I try not to do it in public. <laughs> so you have, and this is a good way of, of going into this whole stream here, you have worked as a publicist, yep. as a promoter, yep. as a booking writer. agent just yep. by itself, as a writer, yeah, as yep. a journalist. Everything. Yeah. Um, and still do. I retired when I was 80 and I thought this would be nice. I can get up every morning. I can live on my, on my wonderful pension from the government and uh, I can go to the coffee shop and I can read the Grope and Fail, my morning newspaper that used to be the best newspaper in the whole world and now isn't. Um, and in three months I was bored silly, but I had at that point lost two, particularly two clients, I won't name them, who were paying me a significant amount of money. So in a sense I'm starting afresh. And age, yeah, he's 85, I don't know, who's the young hotshot publicist? I understand that. Um, I've been disappointed from time to time. I got fired by a band that I had worked with for 39 years. Uh, when I, on my 75th birthday, I thought, nice, nice going guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of weeks ago they said, could you please write a new bio for us because you're the only, you know more about the band than everybody, anybody in it. So I had to do that. I yeah. attempted to tell them to go fly a kite but didn't. You started as a journalist, right? When you first came here, you, you, the, your first job? Well, I was a newspaper reporter in the UK um, and I won a prize or two and when I came here I couldn't get a job in newspapers. Um, in Britain, there were no journalism schools. You were apprenticed, and every newspaper agreed to apprentice one, two, depending on their size of their newspaper, you know, like an internship. Yeah. I was paid the massive sum of three pounds a week, <laughs> and uh, blah. When I came here, the papers were already full of British and Australian trained journalists. And I don't know whether journalism schools existed in 1975, uh, 19, uh, when was it, 1957. Wow. Um, but I got a job, and this is, I, I love this, I got a job, uh, first of all, in the promotion department of a company that published 40 odd trade magazines. And within a few months, I was appointed associate editor of a magazine called Electrical Contracting and Maintenance in Canada. Now, all I know about electricity is you don't put both fingers in the plug at the same time. That's about it. After a while, I was made editor of a Canadian woodworker. I know about woodworking. Don't have your thumb on the top of the nail when you hit it with a hammer. That's about it. But you learn the, um, the language of these different trades and every trade has its own language, has its own organizations, it has its own sets of initials that you're never quite sure what they stand for. And in 90s, I've been bringing in, in conjunction with a friend, um, assorted American blues artists to, to Toronto uh, because I loved their music and I thought 
this way I can get to hear them. So I brought in, again with a friend, a guy called Sleepy John Estes. And Sleepy John was old, toothless, blind, narcoleptic, and I couldn't understand a word he said. But he wrote some of the most amazing songs in that idiom. And in fact, the very first blues record I ever bought back in England when I was a teenager was by him. So I was thrilled to be able to work with him. And then I, we brought in Muddy Waters and then, and so on. And then I got this ill-deserved rep as a blues maven. And I was invited to hope to host a blues workshop at something called a folk festival. I had no idea what the, either of those things were. But it wound up that we sat at a picnic table with John Hammond, Sonny Terry, Brian McGee, Sun House, who was an older alcoholic, amazing guy who had been one of the teachers of Robert Johnson. And uh, and this was at a folk festival. And I met Ian and Sylvia. I met Gordy Lightfoot. Well, I'd met him before, actually. But Buffy St. Marie, Leonard Cohen, Phil Oakes, all these amazing... And it was like... Isaac Newton, you know, had an apple fall on his head and he discovered gravity. I discovered more music than I could deal with. And I've been evangelical about folk festivals, however you define that word, ever since. Every summer I go to at least half a dozen. Um, and I have heard more music, met more friends, changed that festival which was called Mariposa, and it was in third, its fourth year of existence at that time, literally changed my life. Just as evangelicals who discovered Jesus claim their lives have been changed. Well, yeah. this kind of music, this kind of events changed mine. At 85, you probably have one or two other moments, always marriage or children. Are there, are there other things, other moments like that where you said, oh, and then this happened, and it's something that made me feel different, think different, or just changed you in somehow? Well, starting my own publicity company was, was strange. And in 1970, I was, I was fortunate to combine my knowledge of magazine writing, design, layout, publishing, etc. with my, my love of music. And I was, I was asked to produce a magazine called The Canadian Composer for an organization called CAPAC. And CAPAC was one of two performing rights societies that eventually merged in 1991 uh, to become SOCAN. And um, funnily enough, I'd been there maybe two or three weeks. I met Gordy Lightfoot in a bar. Hey, Gordy, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You know. Oh, well, he says, I, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working for CAPAC. I, oh, he says, I'm going in there tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to transfer my membership from BMI in the United States to CAPAC. And I said, well, come to my office first and on the fourth floor, and I'll take you upstairs and introduce you to everybody. So I did that. I introduced the general manager and the vice president and blah, blah, blah. Later that afternoon, I got a call from the, the, the big man who said, do you actually know musicians? And I said that I did. And he said, okay, come on upstairs. Anyway, the result was that I was paid another 250 a week and then given an American Express card and say, take people to lunch. So I did that for the next 21 years. To have them sign up to be represented yeah, by... Yeah, just to yeah. shoot the shit and, you know, be... Yeah. Um, the other thing that happened after a year of, of this and doing their magazine. My first cover story was called Lightfoot. Others down the line, including Stomping Tom Connors and all sorts of other people, um, was the possibility of going to MIDEM, which is an international professional music event. And uh, nobody in the organization wanted to go. And I can't say, it's the last week in January, you stay in Toronto, you go to the south of France. 
It's where I met you. Exactly. I met you there, not in Ontario. Yes. Yeah. And I went for 17 or 18 years in a row. It got me through these awful winters. Just that one week mm. in France and then possibly staying over and going to Madrid or Venice or Amsterdam or whatever. Because the biggest cost was getting there and that was covered. After that, you're on your own. Yeah. And that, I, those years and the stories, are uh, insane. And the one thing you collect in this business is you get a lot of stories. And if you don't get a lot of stories, you seriously blew it. <laughs> right. I'm going to ask you for two stories that I have. One I have first-hand knowledge, one I have second-hand knowledge. Um, uh, uh, Donnie from Downchild Blues Band, yeah. Donnie Walsh, uh, he had, he attended those conventions he in South of couple, France. Yeah. Yes, um, he, he came with his bicycle, he'd never been to Europe before, got his bicycle off the plane, <coughs> reassembled it and had to cycle, what, 30 kilometers from Nice to Cannes. I don't know how the hell he did that. Um, I could tell you some, I, I don't know how far I can go with this, but I'll, I'll tell this and you can always edit it later. My best memory of Donnie was seriously impaired with excess alcohol, staggered up to our mutual friend Peggy Ciccone, who at that time was deeply involved in the management of Rush and a number of other artists staggered up to her while she was having a business meeting in a bar, unzipped his pants and said, dinner for one, Peggy. Whereupon Peggy looked up and said, child's portion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's the rock stories you want, though, when you go to music conventions. Well, the, the other story, I, at many festivals now, and this summer I'm doing these workshops at Mariposa and at the Winnipeg Festival and at the Calgary Festival. It's, it's a little sort of media gathering. I get a bunch of different uh, artists. We call war stories. And they tell, every musician has them. And there are a couple that, that one was told to me by Mike Plume, who's a singer-songwriter from Edmonton. He recalled his very first tour of Europe when he was 20. He's in a van with his band. The uh, promoter is not making any money, but the promoter's provided a, a, a bit of a wonky van and a driver, and they're coming in to Germany from Denmark. As they arrived at the border, four huge German tanks go rumbling through, presumably on a military exercise. And uh, the driver said to the German control guy, um, radio in our van's busted, but uh, is there a war? And the German guy says, maybe, but this time we did not start it. I mean, stuff like that <laughs> didn't happen to me, but it's a great story. And yeah. I just hear so many of those. At you mentioned Peggy Ciccone. Yes. The other story that I was at with you was when someone tried to mug her in yes. a five-star restaurant yes. in St. Paul de Vence. Yes. And you chased after him, if I remember rightly. She burst into tears because the, the guy did not escape with her hand, with her purse. But he came pretty close. There was a wrestle and she was pregnant, so yes. she was very nervous. But yeah. she didn't know she was pregnant at that point. Ah. She only discovered that later. Um, when she got home, she said, oh, you know, we would talk on the phone. She said, oh, I don't know. I'm glad you're okay. She says, yeah. I said, I, I don't know. My dog died. And, oh, God, I'm pregnant. I mean, that's when she found out after after that. But uh, I just felt sorry for the mugger because he picked the wrong woman to oh, mess yeah, with. She mess wasn't with giving that. up the purse. I chased after the mugger, and when they were buying us free drinks at the restaurant, you had made the toast and said, I was an idiot because they could have had guns or knives, and why did I chase when they didn't have the purse? And you were the only one that made sense to me that night. <laughs> well, I remember there's so many Midem stories, but every year the Canadian contingent would go to this place called the Colombe d'Or 
and the art on the wall and um, th there's a bar with more um, Alex called the um, watercolors Miro, Gauguin, yeah, yes. yeah. And I mean, the, the, that's worth a billion dollars in a restaurant. And one of the things you know about restaurants and the expense, how expensive they're going to be, is the size of the menu, the physical size. <laughs> and I remember the first time we went, we all decided that we'd put our credit cards, including my magical American Express card from Capac, mm. into the table and we split it. But I remember our mutual friend Denise Donlan, who was then working for Much Music and on a very strict $30 a day, you know, mm -hmm. turning pale as Bernie Finkelstein ordered a $200 bottle of wine. <laughs> you didn't warn me. One time, my first time there, I sat at his table and wondered why no one was at his table, and it's because he ordered the most expensive wine. <laughs> And then we all had to pay, and we had for, to it. pay for it, right? Yeah, right. Oh, well. <laughs> what What would be your favorite convention of any of those uh, uh, conventions? I'm not saying festivals, but like industry type conventions. Do you have a favorite? Well, I've given up on them mostly these days. Um, I have one great story from Medem, though, that, that I've always remembered. Um, James Brown uh, did a performance uh, in front of an audience of music industry people, and they're the, the worst audience in the world. Got a little fat, hasn't he? Hmm. Doesn't do the splits like he used to do. Hmm. Anyway, the day after, there was a huge press conference in the Palais de Festival for James Brown. He was two hours late. There were 70 or 80 media people, TV, film, pen and paper, radio, television, the lot. And we sat there for two hours waiting for him to arrive. I lost it, collared one of the um, uh, organizers and said, yeah, what is this? Oh, monsieur, we're having a terrible time. We are by accident sending Mr. Brown a white limousine. He would not ride in it. He had to have a black limousine. I said, yes, but he's staying at the Majestic Hotel. It's across the road. I said, he could walk here in, in a minute and a half with a couple of minders. And the medium guy got very upset and said, Sir, you expect the Godfather of Soul to walk? <laughs> uh, what can you say? Yeah, you can't say anything to that. <laughs> What about locally? There are so many new artists popping up, yeah. and you're still on the pulse of this. You're always finding new talent. Who are a couple of people we should be looking out for? Oh, okay. Here's a couple. First of all, and she's now well established in Toronto, uh, it's a woman called Jenny Tai. Um, her real name is Jenny Nolan, but she was born in Thailand, and that's her middle name. Mm -hmm. uh, she plays boogie woogie piano, she writes great ballads. She is full of heart and a lot of soul and the fact she's gorgeously good looking is neither here nor there but it doesn't hurt. The other performer that I, I, I just love uh, is a woman called Catherine Victoria Montgomery and her band is called Cat and the Queen and she stands behind a keyboard and it's kind of punky and theatrical and funny and she waves her arms around a lot which you know waspy people think is a little over the top but she does it with a wink and a grin and she is so likable as a performer uh, she has done a couple of stuff bits locally but nobody to my knowledge has said we should do some. She needs a really good producer to discipline her material, and I've suggested a couple. Uh, also needs a promoter who's good with women's voices. But Cat is a joy. I love it a bit. So I think the world of her. What kind of venues do you go to when you're seeing the the up and coming bands? I have favorite venues. Um, Source, which is a tiny little bar out on on the Danforth near Greenwood. I usually go every Wednesday or every other Wednesday and I always take different people there because the bar is not much bigger than this room. Mm -hmm. 
And if I'm sitting here, the artist is a table width away from me. Uh, I go particularly on Wednesdays because my friend Paul Reddick plays there and Paul... Incredible songwriter. Incredible songwriter. He, he's blues based but he's really pushing the envelope both lyrically and the way he constructs songs and he sings like he believes every word and I, I just love that and this is the best place to hear him. He has a lovely band usually with um, Steve Mariner on guitar, unless Steve is on the road with either his own band Monkey Chunk or recently with Colin James or others. And the band is just great and if you want as a non-musician to sit in a band when it's playing and, it, it, mm -hmm. it, and it's one of the reasons I love folk festivals because you know they're very intimate. You can be sure after 50 years I have a golden backstage pass and, and I'm privileged in that way although I also tell myself I bloody well deserved it uh, right it's lots of work <laughs> um, but that's when music kind of resonates it's almost I don't care what kind of music I remember being in a pub in uh, St. John's Newfoundland I went in the pub with my friend Brooks Diamond who is a promoter down east and Brooks introduced me to the bartender and said, CFA? I said, excuse me? CFA? Come from away? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Where are you from by? Toronto. Oh, I'm sorry. A, a Guinness for this man. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the evening, um, he says, he calls me to the bar. He says, I'm, I'm closing the bar. Don't leave. Rang a little bell. Time, gentlemen, ladies, everybody out. 20 people left, he locked the door, and the music started. There were probably 15 fiddle players, a barn or two, an accordion, a couple of guitars, and I swore they played with the precision of the Toronto <laughs> Symphony with charts in front of them. It is absolutely was one of the most... I remember just standing, you know, around the circle of musicians and feeling it doesn't get any better than this and I'm not a big fan of Tootle A, you know, Celtic key Irish music except go and hear Ashley McIsaac the guy is brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah and talking about Celtic key stuff I mean I worked with Lorena McKennett for 21 years right and you saw her go she took the indie route and really owned her own stuff she absolutely. was a trailblazer in Canada absolutely uh, one of the most I, I don't know where this is is boring but when you sign it and she was looking to sign a distribution deal with Warner Brothers that would distribute her own self-built label and she did something most people don't do. She hired the most expensive lawyer in Toronto and went through that contract clause by clause. What does that mean in English as opposed to legal? Mm -hmm. ah, no, that doesn't work. Anyway, one of the things, I think it was probably, you know, subsection D, page 5, you know, paragraph 2, said if you sign this distribution deal with Warner Brothers Canada, you have automatically signed a distribution deal with every other Warner Brothers territory. Which is lovely. I could have written a press release. Rena McKennett signs international record deal. She said, oh, wait a minute. What happens if the United States or the UK or Germany? They're not not right. interested. Right. You're dead. So she persuaded Warner Brothers to sign what was locally called, and it's now pretty well commonplace, but it certainly wasn't 25 years ago, what was known as the Lorena Deal, which is every Warner Brothers territory had three months to agree to put the record out and another three months to actually release it. And if they failed on either, it reverted to her and she could deal with somebody else in that territory. There's a corollary to this story that I love. She was invited down to Warner Brothers in Burbank and met a legendary figure um, called Mo Austin. And Mo Austin was the president of Warner Brothers Record. 
And he was actually one of those rare individual record company people who actually liked music. There's another one here in Sudan. Steve Kane at Warner Brothers loved, loves music. Anyway, he, they had a meeting. She left the room. He turned to her product manager and said, I don't know if this woman can sell any records, but I wish she managed half the acts we have around here. I thought that was an ultimate compliment. Absolutely. And she's done it her own way with ridiculous success. She uh, just recorded a live album at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Oh yeah, her career's over. She had a hit. <laughs> yeah, right. So she's doing the Royal Albert Hall and sound player in Paris. And she's just got four days in Turkey and, and so on and so on. And when you buy a ticket for her concerts in Canada in the fall, and I, I haven't got the whole thing, but Montreal, Sherbrooke, Quebec City, Toronto, and Ottawa, you will get a free copy of the Live at the Albert Hall record as part of your ticket. So she's going to distribute basically, what, 20,000 copies of a CD? Right. In these trying times, <laughs> I, right. I, I think it's wonderful. Brilliant. Now, you were talking about favorite clubs. You mentioned Source. I what did. are a couple of other mid-sized clubs you love? Front, front Room of the Cameron, I love. Uh, I like the Horseshoe. Great um, sound at the Horseshoe. Yep. After all these years, they haven't messed anything up. I love Lula Lounge, which has, I think, the best sound guy in the, in the, in the city. I'm less enthusiastic about Hughes Room than I used to be. Uh, where else do I hang out? Uh, Still great sound at Hughes Room. Yes. Yeah, yep. great sound. Uh, the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. Terrible sound. Yep. But a, a, a lovely venue. Unfortunately, the way that it, they've renoed it and fixed it, but you can't fix the sound. I remember seeing Tanya Tagak, the most amazing Inuit throat singer, vocalist, soundscape person mm -hmm. um, there, and the sound was awful. Eventually, I, I went up in the balcony and sat next to the sound guy, and it was a bit better there. He could hear it fine. I was down there. It, yeah. Tanya, incidentally, who I, I don't know, I've met her once, I think, but she's the most unusual artist I think I, I can remember seeing. She walks on stage, she chats, hello, I'm living in Toronto now, and I kind of thought I wouldn't like it, but it's really okay, and da 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 da, -da. And then after a few minutes of chat, she starts to sing. And an hour and ten minutes later, she stops. And I am gobsmacked by uh, how, what a roller, emotional roller coaster she puts the audience through. I don't know what she's singing about. A friend of mine said, did you like the bit she did about Gian Gameshi? I said, uh, which bit was that? The bit when she was doing this. <laughs> uh, it was a stunning performance. I adore the woman and somebody I don't know, I've never worked with, I just feel, mm -hmm. I think she's an amazing artist. What about big venues? Obviously I'm thinking... Okay, Massey Hall, done, obviously. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have Massey Hall stories. The very first big concert I ever did was promoting B.B. King in Massey Hall in 1967, 8. And the manager of the hall at that time, a wonderful man called Joe Cotton, he didn't want a deposit. He, he said, yeah, sure, do it. And I did it. And we, the tickets, incidentally, were $4, 450 350 and 250 Oh. And I made $700. And the last time I saw B.B. King before he died was about five or six years ago. I was backstage at Massey Hall and I have no idea why. I probably knew the opening artist or something. As I walked by, B. was standing with his guitar on. The band is on stage playing the play on song. Mm -hmm. And he sees me and hugs me and said, you must have lost money when we did that show all those years ago. And I said, no, but yeah. I said, actually, I made $700. I said, you set me on the road to ruin. 
And he smiled and said, happy to have helped, and walked on stage. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> that really is a magic room, isn't it? Isn't uh, it? Massey Hall is just magic. Miles Davis uh, shows up 45 minutes late for the show. I had to go on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good things happen to those who wait, blah, 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 and I'm blathering away to say that he is coming. The management of Massey Hall is freaking out. The band is ready to go. And as I'm talking, I look down and I notice that the seam on my sleeve jacket has split all the way down. And any minute now, the sleeve is going to roll off your arm. And I completely lost it. I bumbled and bubbled and made a swift exit. And as I exited, Miles Davis walked through the door, took his trumpet out of his case, gave me his coat to hang up, and went on stage and started to play. Ooh. So I'm doing this. I've been writing for some eight years a book called The Night Miles Davis Tried to Buy My Car and 100 other mostly true stories of life at the edge of music. And I don't know whether it's 100 or 150 or 97. I've, mm -hmm. It's just I'm writing these stories down as best as I can. And eventually I'll have it done. I'm, I'm two, three chapters away. Wow. And have you gone to any publishers yet? No. No, well, yeah, I did go to one. And he said, oh, well, you can have, you can have four pictures in this. Well, I said, four. I need 40. Um, it will look like a hardcover magazine. It'll be that format. It, ha it will have 40 to 60 pictures. It will have a narrative going through it. It'll have 10 pieces specifically about people I've met um, and worked with. Uh, Ray Charles, Louis Armstrong, Stompin' Tom Connors, Katie Lang, uh, Lorena, um, Solomon Burke, uh, and it will have these little sidebar stories. Some of, and we're laying it out. The beginning of the book, we've so that we'll have it printed in Taiwan, which is half the cost of it being printed here. And I'm hopefully we'll have this out by fall this year, depending on how long it takes to print. And then next summer, I'll be wandering around first festivals. With your book. Flogging it. I guess you won't need to hire a publicist. Uh, I guess I might do it myself. <laughs> I think so. Save the money. I mean, publicists are so expensive. Now, I mentioned in the intro about, uh, about your birthday party and yeah. some of the people performing. What is it you love the most about aging and celebrating aging? Because some people don't want to celebrate birthdays. They, they kind of run away from them. Well, first of all, I'm doing it as, as I did my 80th birthday party as a, as a benefit. I pay all my expenses and I give the rest to Unison, which is a benevolent organization to help musicians in crisis. And hey, I'm paying it forward. I might need them one day. Um, plus, last time I did it, I got a huge tax refund, uh, which I should have given to Unison as well, but I evilly took it home and spent it on wine, women, and song. Um, so, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't help but celebrate it because it's an excuse for my malfunctions. If I can't remember somebody's name, I pull the age card. Hey, I'm 85, I can't remember anything. And I must say, actually, my memory is pretty damn good, except I never remember when anything was. And I, I don't know whether I'm alone in that. I don't. No, I don't think so, because I'm 56, and I, the timing of when things happen. If I see somebody and I say, oh, your daughter, she must be like 14 now. No, she's 30. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I don't, I, I don't remember things. I have a similar things. thing. I'm spending, I'm going out this evening, actually to Source, to hear Paul Redding, and I'm going with an old friend who I've reconnected with, who I worked with in the 80s. And I swear she's 35. 
And the other night she said, you know, you know I'm actually 60 next week. I went, no, you're not. You know? So people look at me and say, well, he, he doesn't look like he's 85. And God knows I don't act it. So I, I, I'm not celebrating being old. I don't like being old. I wish I was 40 again. I wish at 40 I knew what I've managed to learn now, including the fact that I still don't know tons and tons and tons of stuff that I should know, but I don't. Um, and, and for that, I rely on younger people. Right. You have a lot of friends that are all different ages. I've yes. noticed that. Yeah. And if my phone goes wrong, I give it to my 13-year-old granddaughter and she'll Fix hand it. it back to me. Fixed it. Oh, geez, that was embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you hang out with people all different ages. Yeah. You raise money for charity. Yeah, a little bit. When yeah. you're, when you're yeah. doing birthdays. And you celebrate the fact that you're alive, not the fact that you're aging. Every morning I celebrate the fact that I'm alive when I wake up. Ah, okay, another day. Um, and I try not to waste them. Although many days I do. Um, I, I'm not celebrating being old, I don't think. I'm just celebrating the fact that I'm alive. And the people who are going to perform at my party are... Our friends, uh, a couple of my clients, um, and I'm I, I'm honoured that they would do this. They don't get paid. They're going to come and sing a couple of songs, and you're going to be a, one of the three MCs. Mm -hmm. um, the the other two are well, Shakura Saida has been a pal for at least a decade, and she gives me. Far too many compliments as to how I've helped her. Incidentally, one of the best things I've had, best experiences, is being able to travel with musicians. I'm probably not a road manager, but anybody who's on the road with a band is either a groupie or a road manager, and I'm a combination. I've had two trips to Australia, one to New Zealand with a band from Nunavut called the Cherry Cans who are so much fun to be on the road with, it's ridiculous, there should be laws. Um, Shakura um, is, I think it has to be finally confirmed, but going to play the major festival in Australia next April. I said, I'm coming, I'll pay my ticket, but when I'm there, I'm carrying guitars, I'll do the financial settlement, I'll bunk in with one of the guys in the band, but I'm going to be touring Australia one more time. I love Australia. And Shakura is going to raise the roof out of an oh, outdoor absolutely. festival, right? Of course she is. Wow. Course what she a is. talent she I is. Know. Unbelievable <laughs> what she can do on stage. It's so funny. Years ago, um, she was booked for the legendary Rhythm and Blues cruise. Called me up and said, uh, do you want to go on a cruise? Well, I'm never going to go on a cruise. So I said, of course, yes. <laughs> so um, she said, well, there's a catch. You're going to have to share a cabin with me. I said, yeah, and six stage outfit, outfits and 20 pairs of shoes. I can see it now. So it turned out that didn't actually, I did go on a cruise, but we didn't share a cabin. But it was an amazing experience. And apart from the fact that I became friends with Betty Levette, who is a singer I've always admired. Out of Detroit, what a voice. Oh. Wow. And have you heard a new album of Bob Dylan material? Yes. She just, you know, I, I've, I've only briefly met Bob Dylan and just as one does with him, uh, the briefest of, hello, how are you? Nice to see you, goodbye. Um, if he didn't love that record, I mean, he took her material and reassembled it completely, uniquely special. Yeah. And she's 72 and she said, I've got a major record deal. Yes. <laughs> Unbelievable. There's hope for all of us. Thank you, my brother. Well, 85 you. years young. You're going to have an amazing party coming up. I hope so. Yeah. And you can... Uh, oh, and may I say one thing? Sure. Everybody's invited to this. It's just not my friends and family, although I hope 
they will be there. Mm -hmm. But anybody who wants to hang out, listen to all these people, watch a couple of young ladies take most of their clothes off of the burlesque people, uh, it'll be cool. <laughs> that keeps you young too. Thank you, my <laughs> Cheers. Ah, Richard Flohill. Gotta love that guy. Listen, join me next week. There's always a new fascinating guest on the James B. podcast. So join me next Friday. And please, share this. Share it with your friends. Why don't you? See you next week.